uh, because this is the very reason we want to have lectures. So you'll come and you'll learn and then you'll go out and you'll live in ways that show the difference that they can make. Yeah. Um, yes, I've known Katie and Bill Warren longer than anyone else in this room, as far as I know. Um, we were older missionaries. Notice that I didn't say old. Uh, <laughs> older missionaries. In uh, 1983, we were just about to finish our years of service as, as missionaries. And Bill and Katie arrived. <coughs> so that's been quite a while. Roy and I had gone to Spain in 1953. So that's a few years ahead of that. I was telling Katie uh, when she told me, it reminded me that their older son, Will, was two when they came to Italy. That was the age of our son when we arrived in Barcelona mm -hmm. uh, way back in 1953. So there are lots of things that we have in common, uh, including our love for the seminary in Cali, uh, Colombia. They have two sons, Bill and Ben. Ben was born in Latin America. <coughs> So he is a native-born, as we had native-born also uh, children, in, uh, one in Spain and then one later in Chile. Will, the older boy, a man, uh, has eight sons. Uh, now, according to Katie, <laughs> According to Katie, they kept hoping for a daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say, but it's embarrassing, so I just say they want a girl and they want to set up for a cat. <laughs> she can tell it better than I. Uh, but their son, um, their son Ben, has a daughter, a son, and a daughter. So uh, I think the youngest one is one month old. Oh, about a month old. About a month old. So that's hard to leave your, <laughs> your children when they're that young, isn't it? But, but the, God has blessed them, and God has blessed uh, the ministry that they have shared. And I'm so glad <clears throat> you experienced it this morning. And I'm so glad you have the opportunity of experiencing it tonight and being a part of what God wants to do with these lectures. So open your Bibles, open your minds, open your hearts, and welcome God's Word and Bill Warren. Would you give them a little bit welcome? Well, thank you so much, and uh, the Wyatts were tremendously impacting in our lives in Colombia. Uh, that time was a tremendously impacting time in our lives. It's a time uh, I will never forget, never will it cease to mold and shape who we are. And I continue to have the joy of going there and teaching there uh, every year, and then I usually teach two other classes online for them each year as well. And so... Uh, uh, it's great to keep the connections there. What I don't understand is some of the ones that were the older ones among my students are retiring. <laughs> I don't understand how that happens when I haven't retired. <laughs> so, but anyway, I enjoy what I'm doing, and God's blessed me with health to this point, and so uh, we're going to keep plugging forward. You know, as we think about different people, we need to know some about our stories, and it's been mentioned to me that I ought to tell this story, and uh, you need to know where people come from. And my wife started attending the Baptist church, as we say, about nine months before she was born, and uh, uh, her, 
and she has this habit, she'll just say what she thinks, doesn't matter if I'm speaking or not. <laughs> so y'all just relax, just enjoy it. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have never considered divorce killing each other every now and then I wonder about but not divorce so, uh, uh, I was born in Tennessee in Shelbyville but I was two months old when my dad transferred down to Eglin Air Force Base and uh, uh, so I don't know much about Shelbyville other than we made a few trips back to see the setting and everything uh, uh, so I consider Florida as my home uh, northwest Florida. It was a small town called Valparaiso, right, literally, right up against the Air Force Base, and it was a big impact on our lives with the Air Force being there. My dad it was civil service by then, so we actually got to stay in that setting, minus a, a short-term uh, time out at Vandenberg in California, then we went back to Eglin after that. I was not raised Baptist. I was not like my wife. And uh, uh, I was raised as, and we used to jokingly call ourselves Whiskey Palian. And uh, uh, my dad got upset with the priest because the priest out drunk him once. And uh, uh, I mean, what do you expect somebody that went through the Navy? You know how they're going to be. So. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, it was impacting on my life. I had some high spiritual moments in the Episcopal Church. I was an altar boy, everything else. Uh, acolyte, and uh, it, it did some good things in my life, but I never really made a personal commitment uh, to it. I memorized the creeds for confirmation and everything, and so I was starting to go in some really bad directions during those teenage years. It happens a lot of times. We all have fears of our children doing that. My wife said, don't you dare tell them what you used to do. <laughs> so uh, uh, that's what grandparents are for, though. We tell the grandkids what we used to do, because now we're already past that time, right? And so I kept being invited to go to this little home Bible study. We had left the Episcopal Church by this time, and uh, I didn't want to go. I mean, that just didn't sound like the right thing to do on a weekend night, go to a home Bible study. And they just kept asking, and finally I said yes, just to get them to quit asking. And so I went to this little home Bible study. I say little. It was probably uh, 15, 20, probably about 20 people actually packed into the house there. And I got there, and my worst fears came about. There was an old lady teaching it. And I'm thinking, I'm a teenage boy in high school, and I'm thinking, that's probably about the last thing I want to do, come give up a weekend night to hear an old lady talk. But all these other people were there. And once you're in, you can't leave. <laughs> And uh, plus my ride was there. I wasn't the one driving. And I had a motorcycle, but I rode in the car. And my sister actually drove me there. And so there wasn't a lot of option. And so I'm there and we're listening. And somebody in that study realized that three of us who were youth, uh, that something was happening. And they took us over in the next room, the living room. And they said, we need to talk some. And I understood, too, I needed to listen some. And that was when I actually gave my life to Christ. It was part of the beginnings of the Jesus movement back in 1970. What I learned as I kept going to that Bible study is that old lady who didn't have anything that I thought ought to be listening to was Corrie Ten Boom. And she would stay for the summers in our little town because she had dear friends who lived there. She did some of her writing there. They actually kept part of their house for her specifically. And so I was actually very privileged to listen to her many times during those first stages of my Christian life. And uh, she would speak in our town at different churches and everything on different things coming up. And so I was blessed. Later on, I decided to go into a Baptist church. I told the pastor I narrowed it down to two different options. We didn't have every option there. And uh, so I narrowed it down and I decided it was either going to be Baptist or Assemblies of God. And um, we were sort of meeting on the beach and houses, on little gatherings, coffee shops, whatever. And so I knew I needed to get in a church. I just felt like I needed to be attached to a, a steady body of believers for my growth as a Christian. And so I decided to go with the Baptist. And what 
cause me not to go with the assemblies of God is, um, I mean, we had a lot of those things happening. We'd have beach gatherings and people were falling out left and right. I didn't know what it was at first. Scared the bejeebies out of me. And I said, what's wrong with these folks? Don't they know how to stand up on a beach? And uh, uh, they said, no, they're being slain in the spirit. And I didn't understand that because I hadn't read about that in the Bible. But anyway, so they had somebody and they were trying to get this person to speak in tongues. And they, uh, it just wasn't happening. And they're all praying and everything and it's not happening. And then one of them finally says, just start blowing. And the guy starts blowing. <laughs> And somebody else starts twittering his lips for him. And then somebody said, I think I heard it. I think I heard it. That was, now I was trying to be a mathematician. I wanted to get my doctorate in math. And my mind didn't function quite like that. And that was when I decided, I believe the Baptists are my group. <laughs> and I went into the Baptist church. And God led me since then. And so, but it's amazing to see how God leads us forward in our lives. And I bet every one of you has a life story that actually would be impacting for us along the way. When we think about parables, these are impacting stories and they impact our lives. And a lot of times these are stories that you'll grab a hold of and at different points in your life, you will feel like you're part of one of these stories. We only find these stories in the Synoptic Gospels. John does not have parables. Uh, he simply doesn't go that way. He doesn't have exorcisms either. Uh, you won't find those in the Gospel of John. Uh, he really takes a different approach. We almost wonder, but what John wasn't a little more associated with some of the Sadducee beliefs. Uh, uh, because he gets an entry into the trial section because he's friends with the high priest. And we don't know for certain. There's not enough evidence to say definitely. But he... he takes a very different track on how he tells the life of Jesus. I love a Spanish book that's out. I haven't ever found one in English, uh, but it's called um, Los Milagros Son Parabolas Tambien. The miracles are parables also. Well, actually, what John calls them are signs. And he says he, you have signs, and he has seven big signs in John. But the parables are ones that actually speak to us and the struggle the parables have had is that we tend to take some of their details and we go to extremes with them. Some of that's trying to make them relevant. And we do that with the Bible, not just with parables. We try to make it relevant, and a lot of times we tear it right out of its context to make it relevant. And that's not what we need to be doing <laughs> because it made sense to them. And so what we need to do is try to figure out how did it make sense to them? Because that's how it's probably going to speak the loudest to us because they're real human beings with real life issues just like us. And so these parables are speaking to these real life issues that we have. And that's what we'll see through these parables. There was a trend on parables to say, you know, well, they can mean most anything, this symbolic focus. And then a guy came up with the idea, no, every parable teaches one central truth. We haven't totally gone away from that. Adolf Euliker was his name, but uh, we haven't gone totally away from that, but we've gone away from it a little bit. As we learn more about the context, what we realize is it teaches one main positive truth, <laughs> but it may teach some other truths that are not so positive. <laughs> and so many times, especially if you have human characters in a parable, you're going to find each human character represents an option. And many times you'll have two represent one option and one represents another option. And you've got to realize which one of these am I supposed to be like? Where's the example for me among these that are there? And that's where we will see the parables come to life for us, is as we identify those. So there are some today saying the norm is for most parables to have three characters. But you get plenty with two, so it's not a hard and fast rule. And many times those options will be positive and negative. And it's telling you as much about what not to do, don't be like this one, as it is be like this one. But it will have one central positive focus, by and large. And that's where we're still at today on how to understand the parables. And there have been many scholars along the way, and as they've studied the background and such, they come to life. And nowadays, we're able to study more of the background of the Bible than we ever have been able to do 
since, especially the time of this major shift in our culture away from agrarian cultures. And uh, with the Industrial Revolution, with other items that happened, uh, even before the 1800s, we increasingly got away from that culture. Now, we got away from it geographically just because of the movement and expansion of Christianity. But culturally, we got away from it more and more as we got away from those type settings. Democracy, well, the Bible doesn't know anything about democracy like we know of it. Capitalism, the Bible doesn't know anything about that type of capitalism like we know of it. And so we know we're at a large distance. And so we have to bring in this information to try to bridge the gap and understand where is it coming from on the text and what are they thinking about. Because when you deal with agricultural settings, in the first century, 90 plus percent of the people are living in small towns in the countryside. 90 plus percent. Now you look at our culture and everybody's in the cities and they're going there even more so. And the countrysides are struggling to keep their populations and keep their, their economies going because everybody's going where the jobs are and those are in the uh, urban, suburban, exurban type areas. And so it's a very different culture for us. There was no place in the first century, aside from imperial settings under the emperor, that actually had a factory with more than 50 workers. Think about that. Most of those would have been slaves even then. But they just didn't have factories like that. Now, they had all agricultural settings, but not factories per se. And so almost everybody's in that agricultural, agricultural setting. And the parables reflect that because they come right out of that small town set. Jesus is not a city person. He really doesn't do well in cities. They crucify him in the city. And that's just not his forte, going to the cities. He's a small town person. He's a country type person. Paul's a city person. There you get a different emphasis. He's raised in a city, Tarsus. He's used to the city. He's got the education of a city person. He comes to Jerusalem to the biggest city, Jewish type city in the context, Caesarea probably was bigger population-wise. Some of the Decapolis cities were bigger on population. But Jerusalem was the heart of Judaism. And that's where he comes and he studies. So he's a city person, so guess where he goes on his journeys? Well, he's a city person. He's going to go to the cities. He's not going to the masses. He's going to the gathered groups. And God uses him. And it's amazing the response that comes about. But when we talk about these, this context, we oftentimes say, well, everybody knew Greek in the first century. And it's simply not true. In a lot of the outlying areas, they don't even necessarily know Greek. Now, we do think Jesus was trilingual. He knew three languages. He knew Hebrew. He knew Aramaic. You see those in the Gospels themselves. And you see the statements there. Eli, Eli, Lemat, Sabachthani. Eloi, Eloi. And the difference is simply one's in Aramaic in Mark's gospel, one's in Hebrew in Matthew's gospel. Uh, that's a citation, granted. But we do feel like he knew both. But now increasingly we're finding Greek inscriptions in Galilee. And they're being found even in the small towns. And we know the big cities were dominant with Greek coming about there. And so increasingly we feel like the likelihood is Jesus also knew some Greek. His reading ability, we don't know that that expanded over to Greek. We know he can read, apparently, Hebrew in the synagogue. He's opening the scroll, uh, Luke chapter 4, and he's reading. And he seems to know uh, Hebrew there for reading. And because you don't just accidentally um, pick it up and say, I think I can read this. You have to have been taught. And they're actually amazed who taught him. Where did he learn this? And because that's not the norm for people to be literate, especially from the small towns. But then he tells these stories, and it just draws people in. And he basically presents his theology through these stories in the Synoptic Gospels. So if you ever want to just do a good study on the theology of Jesus, his theology, look at the parables. And you're going to see a lot of that shining through. He starts with the parables with one specific parable. And it's sort of the lead-in parable. Now, parables have two backgrounds to them. In the Old Testament, we have a book of parables. 
but we don't call it parables. We call it proverbs. And in the Old Testament Hebrew context, these mashal, these proverbial statements, were ones you could use in any given context. And we find them in the New Testament too. A prophet's not with a, without honor except in his own hometown. That's one of these Old Testament type proverbial statements. And it's called a parable, but we think of the story parables. And you have some of those in the Old Testament. Think of Isaiah chapter 5. And we have a very well understood parable that Jesus actually revamps and reuses, repackages in the New Testament. But these mashal, these proverbial statements, we'll find them in multiple contexts. We'll look at one of those. We're not going to center on those. I want us to focus most on these story parables. Now, for us, stories are what? They're illustrations, right? So we have the story of the Good Samaritan and what's happening to the guy who gets waylaid by the thieves. They find him and he's what? Half dead, half dead. And so we know exactly what that means, right? Because we know what half dead's about because it's just like the couple who had this fuss going on and they're fighting like cats and dogs with each other. And finally the wife says, I'm leaving and she walks out for just to get away from the house. And she goes out there, and sure enough, she finds this seashell, and she starts cleaning it up, and a genie comes out. Says, now I want you to know, I'm going to give you three wishes, but I'm not going to get involved in your fight. I'm not part of this. So whatever you ask for, your husband's going to get double, just so that I'll make sure that you're not dragging me into this fight. She says, okay, I can live with that. First, I'd like to be rich. I'd like a million dollars here. Not as much now as when... Uh, maybe we, she would have thought about it. And poof, there she has a million dollars. And poof, there he is, two million bucks. Just appears right before him. She said, now I want to be the most beautiful woman in the world. She says, okay, but he's going to be the most handsome man in the world. I can handle that. Poof, there she is. Poof, there he is. And then she says, I want you to beat me till I'm half dead. <laughs> We know what half dead's about. <laughs> Let's look at some of these parables. The starting point for any teaching is to be able to listen. A lot of people have missed the point of this parable, but you're going to see it right off. So again, he began to teach by the sea, Sea of Galilee. That's a place of discipleship in the Gospel of Mark. It's a place for calling disciples. It's a place for teaching disciples, for forming disciples. <coughs> And a very large crowd gathered around him. So he got into a boat on the sea, sat down, while the whole crowd was by the sea on the shore. And he taught them many things by means of parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, Now we're going to get a short parable here, the parable of the sower. And I want you to look at something here. You see this first word, and it says what? Listen. Now let's jump to the end of it. And what you see is, let anyone who has ears to hear, listen. So what do you think this parable is about? It's about listening. Now, it's even clearer when you go to that underlying text. And I'm not trying to impress you. I just want you to see. And you have a word right here, akuete, and it means listen. It's an imperative. Listen. Jesus was from, born in Bethlehem, a little bit south. So he would have said, y'all listen. It's a plural, second person plural. Y'all listen. And then right at the end, he will say, and he will say, whoever has ears un understood on your head, use them. Well, not quite. Whoever has ears with which to listen, listen. And so we know this is about listening. Now, here's what this is not about. This parable is not about types of Christians. Ah, This is not about really good Christians, carnal Christians, worldly Christians, and maybe not even Christians. That's not what it's about. And the reason is, in the time of Jesus, you don't talk about Christians yet. <laughs> There's no cross-resurrection yet. And so he's actually talking directly to Jewish folks. And so let's see how we're supposed to listen. He said, listen, consider the sower went out to sow. And he, as he sowed, some seed fell 
along the path. Now, they knew how these lands were. And everybody used the same land year after year. And you knew where the hard path was. And you knew where the rocks come up near the surface of the soil. And you know where the weeds are going to come right back again. This is not an unknown item, but you expect most of the land's going to be good land or you wouldn't keep farming it. They're not stupid back then. They're not going to farm land thinking, you know what, past going to take up a third of it. Stony ground's going to take a third. The weed's going to take a third. I ain't going to get nothing off of this, but I'm going to work like a dog anyway. <laughs> they know this is good land by and large. And they expect a harvest off of it. How much of a harvest? That's what they don't know. So he sowed, and some goes along that path. Birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky soil where it didn't have much soil. It grew up quickly since the soil wasn't deep, and we know how that is. The moisture stays near the surface, and the seeds are going to germinate quickly. The only problem is they can't really get those roots down, and it's going to dry up as fast as it gets wet. When the sun came up, it was scorched. Since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up, choked it. It didn't produce fruit. Still other seed, and here's where the catch comes. And this is why your translations are important. And it's why you want your pastors to know the languages. Because here we've gone through all this. And what this is, is other seed fell on good ground. And it grew up producing fruit that increased 30, 60, and 100 fold. How much seed do you think fell on each part? Do you think it was an equal amount? One fourth here, one fourth there? In our translations, we don't know. Here's what's amazing. When we look at this, what he actually says is, I'm just going to click on it, okay? And what it says there is that this is a singular now. Ah, not plural, it's singular. Some, a little bit. Now we go down, that's on the pathway. And now we're going to go to where we go, and we get some among the stony ground. And here we get the word, and it actually says again, this is a singular word. It's not plural, it's singular. And a little bit more fell on the stony ground. And if you go to Israel, you know they got rocks everywhere. And so then we go on, and now we're going to go to the thorny ground, and here we go, and it's singular again. And a little bit falls here. Now we go down to this last part. And all of a sudden, he says it in the plural. And the vast majority of the seed falls on the good ground. To where it, that's where most of it falls. So what's he actually trying to tell us on this? He's not trying to tell us, let's feel real good about ourselves, and we're all the good ground. And that's the end of the parable, because other folks out there, those are the stony ground. Those are the thorn-filled ground. Those are the pathways. And we're good Christians, and so we're okay. Because he's not talking about Christians or non-Christians. He's talking to Jewish folks listening to him. But if you don't listen to God, you're not going anywhere in your spiritual life. Because you've got to learn how to listen. And when God speaks to us, how are we going to listen? And he'll tell us that on the interpretation. He says, you're going to form patterns of listening. We understand that. Because sometimes we form patterns of listening to where we hear, but we don't hear. Now, I have to struggle on this one. Maybe y'all don't. Because my wife will be talking, and I'll be watching something on TV, and I'll say, yeah, uh-huh. I don't have a clue what she said. I don't have any idea what she's talking about. But I figure, well, at least I'll be able to keep watching my show. I'll just sort of chime in every now and then. And then she'll ask me, what did I just say? <laughs> And I have no idea what she just said because I'm still having to learn to listen because it's a lot more important for me to listen to her than to watch whatever is on the idiot box because I can watch that thing almost any time. I can even watch it as a rerun if I want to nowadays. We've got to learn how to listen and we form patterns on listening. And it does teach us about that. 
but sometimes when God tries to speak to me, not somebody out there, when God tries to speak to me, when God tries to speak to you, sometimes I am like that pathway. And it goes in one ear and right out the other. And I've got ears on my head, but I just don't use them. And it goes through so fast, I don't even know what was being said because I'm so distracted with other things. And if they don't listen to what God's saying in Jesus, when are they going to listen? When am I going to listen? And sometimes I am the stony ground. And it comes in, and I get so excited about it. This is going to change my life. But the next day, I just sort of go on my merry way because it didn't really get down to the depth of my soul, and it's not going to change anything in my life. And sometimes I am the thorny ground, and I really want this to happen in my life, but the things around the world and everything, it just sort of goes away. But praise God that most of the time, when we're willing to listen and we hear, it produces not just a good harvest, virtually a miraculous harvest. And God revolutionizes and changes our lives. So how's your listening? And he starts his ministry with parables on how is your listening. Because you see, if you don't get the listening down, The rest of it really doesn't make much of an impact, does it? Because remember, these Gospels are written to be read out loud to folks. They're not written for private reading. We've got the privilege of private reading. But they're written to where you're going to read it to a congregation, and they need to hear first. Now, before we go any further on this story, how's your listening? How's your listening? Because I've just heard some examples of bad listening. The ones from Jerusalem, they're saying, he's possessed by Beelzebub. He's doing this by means of evil powers. What's happening to him? This isn't from God. And he's having to correct them. How's Satan going to cast out Satan? House divided against itself, it can't stand. Kingdom divided against itself, it's not going to stand. And then he actually says, you better be careful. Because you're right on the verge of a sin that doesn't get forgiven because you don't know how to listen. And you're actually saying the things from God are not even from God. we got to learn how to listen. And that's where he starts us off. But you know he goes a lot further than just the listening. He'll give us the interpretation. He'll tell us what the purpose of the parables are. So when he's alone, those around him with the twelve asked about the parables, and he answered them, the secret of the kingdom of God. Wait a minute. This mystery of the kingdom of God, he's saying, has been given to them. And they loved mysteries. Everybody loves a mystery. How would you like to be the one who knew the secret of making your life with God go forward in the best of ways? And this is the mystery of the kingdom of God. And he says, here's the catch. You've got it. It's been given to you. But you know, Not everybody's got this. He cites Isaiah from chapter 6. Isaiah's called. Hear my Lord, send me. Baker James Cawthon preached in our chapel. That was one of the messages used to help move me towards missions. I was already leaning that way. He was an amazingly powerful speaker. And uh, what he didn't focus on is he focused on hear my, send me. He never focused on the part comes right after it. And that's what you got right here. But you know what? They're not going to listen to you. I'm going to send you out there. But don't think it's going to be a bed of roses. You're going to get a lot of opposition. Things aren't always going to go good for you. But you're still being sent by me. And you still need to go forth and proclaim the message. Because some are going to respond. And it's going to be revolutionary when they do. The whole context will be changed. He says to those outside, everything comes in parables. The ones outside are those that are rejecting him. It's not the ones not in the house. He's talking about the ones like these ones from Jerusalem that have come down. And those outside, well, if you're going to reject what God's saying to you in Christ, 
you're not going to understand. You have to learn how to listen along the way. Now, we wonder about that. He gives his interpretation of it. You've basically just heard a lot of that. But then he goes and he says one more thing before we shift to a, the next one. And he also said to him, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? Now, I bet your translations basically say it that way. And I tried to get them not to put it this way in this text because it's not what the text actually says. Because it doesn't say, is a lamp brought? What it says is, does a lamp come? Ah. And he actually uses a strange structure there. But he's actually saying, does a lamp come? Well, lamps don't come, do they? When they do, you need to go get a checkup. Because something ain't working right. But lamps don't come. This is where one theologian, Edward Schillebeck, says, what he's actually saying is he is the parable of God. And I think that's a great way of viewing this because it is a lamp who's coming. It's a light coming into this world. And it's basically Jesus saying, when a lamp comes, like he's come into this world, well, the whole purpose is to shine a light on things, not to be hidden. And he's not trying to give us an explanation of parables that says, I'm trying to hide this from everybody because he wants you to listen. So obviously he's not trying to say, don't listen. When God commissions Isaiah, he's not saying, and I don't want anybody to respond to you. He's simply saying, but a lot of them are not going to respond to you. And you need to anticipate you're not always going to get a positive response. But you still better watch out for your response. And so when God speaks to us, we better be ready to respond. To respond. Because this lamp, it's not going to be hidden, put under a basket, under a bed. Isn't it to be put on a lampstand? And that's exactly why Christ has come. There's nothing hidden that will not be revealed, nothing concealed that will not be brought to light. If anyone has ears on his head, let him listen. If you've got ears with which to hear, listen. Same phrase he had at the end of the parable. And now he's wrapping up the section. And the section is, but you, you need to listen. Because I'm putting God himself on display before you. He's the parable of God, the incarnation of God, to where if you want to know what God's like, we say, look at Jesus, don't we? And that's how you know who your God is. And when you look at Jesus, you don't see a God that's going to tell you to strap a bomb vest onto you and go blow yourself up and kill innocent people. You don't see that. And we as Christians understand that's not who God is. Sometimes we get misguided. But we understand that's not our God because that's not what we see in Christ. And he doesn't say, go hate anybody who does something bad against you. Because that's not what we see in Christ. And he's revealed to us who our God is. In that sense, we have the beginning of the parables. So when God speaks to you, how are you going to listen? How are you going to listen? Just ask yourself, the beginning of the day, it's a good way to start. And just say, Lord, help me to actually listen to you today. Help me to listen to the people around me that I need to be listening to. Help me to listen. He has another one. And I think we have a struggle point on this parable. Because I think we've got a whole lot of folks that would pick the wrong option on this one. Now we're jumping over to Matthew. Matthew 13 is a whole section of parables. And uh, I simply wanted to pull some from the different Gospels. There's a whole other study to do a narrative study of the parables within their context in each Gospel. Because they do differ from Gospel to Gospel, especially Luke versus uh, uh, Mark and Matthew, or Matthew versus Luke. Uh, Matthew has a lot of the Mark and stuff in it. So the kingdom of God may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, but while people were sleeping, the enemy came, sowed weeds among the wheat, and left. When the plant sprouted, produced grain, then the weeds also appeared. The landowner's servants came to him and said, Master, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Then where did the weeds come from? The tares, we tend to say, wheat and the tares. An enemy did this, he told him. So do you want us to go and pull them up? The servants asked him. 
And that's where I think we have our problem. No, he said, when you pull up the weeds, you might also uproot the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. At harvest time, I'll tell the reapers, gather the weeds first, tie them in bundles to burn them, but collect the wheat in my barn. Do you know what the Pharisees wanted to do? The Pharisees were champions of the ones who said, let's pull up the tares. And they were ready to weed out all of those who weren't as spiritual as what they thought they ought to be. Now, it's by their rules. Because they decided you needed to know what it meant to keep the Sabbath. So they, and other scribes and others in the history, started drawing out rules. Then what does it mean to keep the Sabbath? And they had this huge number of rules. You can walk so far, but no further. You can write, but the ink has to disappear by the next week. Wax tablets helped out on that one because you just put them out in the sun and they melt again and all of a sudden your writing's gone. You did not violate the Sabbath. But if your writing remained from one week to the next, you had violated the Sabbath. Amazing rules that they had. They weren't Old Testament rules. They were their traditions along the way on how to define it. But what they're basically doing is say, here's what it means to be right with God. Here are the rules. You follow the rules and everything's good for you. And if you don't, we will pull you out and expose you as tares. Folks, we got a lot of people who would love to do some tear pulling. Here's the difficulty. I've already mentioned it to a couple here. I like the way Soltz and Nietzsche said it. When asked about how do we deal with evil, and he said, the problem is you can't gather up all the evil people and put them in prison or ship them to an island or get them somewhere else because the dividing line between good and evil runs right through the middle of the heart of every human being. And we all have our struggles with it. That's the biblical message. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And it's not some bad guy over there and I'm good. It's not those are the tares and we're the wheat. Let's let God sort it out at the end, and let's not be tear pullers. Now, does that mean no morality? No, of course it doesn't mean that. You can't read the Old Testament and not know that a holy God wants a holy people. Of course he does. And we may be in Christianity about a lot more than morality, but we're never about less than morality. If you're gonna, not going to relive a respectful life, with integrity, with morality at the core of who you are, treating people in the right ways, being the right type of person, then you're not walking how God wants you to walk. We know that's part of who we're called to be. But we also know, now let's go beyond me to somebody else's life. When I want to play God in their life and be the tear puller, I'm going to probably mess their life up a lot. Now, I can help lead them, guide them, have an impact on them. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about ones who want to be the judges, and they actually want to say, this is a tear, and that's wheat. And the problem is the roots are all intertwined, and you're going to damage the whole enterprise. In a sense, we like to say that's the problem with legalism, because with legalism, you end up doing almost as much damage as good a lot of times. But the parable doesn't actually address legalism per se. But that's where we have to be careful about uprooting them. I want to jump to another one because I see where the time's going. My wife says I'm really bad about telling you how to build the clock rather than what time it is. So y'all just bear with me. <laughs> she is really good at listening. <laughs> I need to get her some hearing aids that actually make you not hear. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Reverse hearing aids sometimes. <laughs> when Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, this is a little bit earlier, he moved on from there to teach, preach in their towns, villages, be better. When John the Baptist, he's talking about, heard in prison what the Messiah was doing, he sent a message through his disciples asking, are you the one who's to come or... <laughs> So we expect someone else, because this ain't exactly a revolution, Jesus. Something's not happening around here. I'm in prison. You not. 
You don't even seem to be speaking out against what they've done to me. What's going on here, Jesus? We're supposed to get the Romans out of here. John the Baptist is a prophet. He's addressing political leadership. That's what prophets do in the Old Testament. By and large, they're affiliated with the royal court. They're not just on the local level in the villages. By and large, they're speaking to the powers. And they're telling them when they're off track because if they lead the nation in the wrong way, it filters all the way down from them. In that sense... He says, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect another? Jesus replies, and he says, you go tell John what you just saw. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor are told the good news, and blessed is the one who isn't offended by me. Takes a little jab at the end there. Here's what he doesn't say. And we just overcame a whole bunch of Romans in that city, and we kicked them out of that city, and now we got control of this part of the land, it's not the Messiah John was expecting. John really expected to have a total political change. We don't know how intertwined he was with the Essenes. We do feel that at least there was some contact between the two. That he was a member doesn't seem that likely, but that he had some impact. And the Essenes basically left Jerusalem because Dead Sea Scrolls is what we're talking about on the community, because the corruption in the Jewish leadership around the temple had gone so sky high, they said, we cannot be part of this anymore. This corruption is beyond what we can tolerate. Somebody needs to change it. They had so much money in the temple treasury, they were literally buying widows' houses out from underneath them when they could not afford the taxes. And they're using temple money for it. That's why the offering is such a big issue about the widow putting in her last two widow's mites, we call them. Because she's given everything. And they're supposed to take care of the widows. Widows and orphans and foreigners. Overseas, I really like the part about the foreigners. But anyway, they're supposed to be taking care of them. And what are they doing? They're sapping them of everything they can give because of their devotion to God. And they're basically using religion as a money-making scheme in the temple. When the Romans sack Jerusalem, they take so many riches out of Jerusalem, they impose a tax on the Jews that all the money they would have given to the temple on their annual payment to the temple goes to the Roman Empire. They build the Colosseum out of the funds derived from sacking Jerusalem and this Jewish money coming in. They enjoy almost three decades of economic prosperity because of all the money they got out of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. What are you doing accumulating that much money when you're supposed to be helping folks? And that's what they're not doing. But John the Baptist expects that type rule to be overthrown because it's abuse. Jesus denounces it. The ones he criticizes the most are exactly Jewish leaders. That's the prophetic role he has. Speaking truth to power, truth in love to power, but speaking truth to power, and he denounces the abuses, it gets him crucified. But he still doesn't stop doing it. In that sense, he says, you need to realize what is happening. The people are being helped. The people are being helped. And they're being healed. And they're having things happen that just never seem like a possibility to them. As these men were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed swaying in the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? No. See, those who wear soft clothes are in royal palaces. Those are the ones that are the problem. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it was written. See, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. A great quote from Isaiah, starting into the servant songs in Isaiah, one of the most quoted books in the New Testament, along with Psalms. Truly, I tell you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he, because what you saw in John isn't even able to hold a light to what you're going to see resulting after all of this finishes up, as the kingdom of God starts becoming more and more of a reality. 
From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been suffering violence. That's a translation we can use on that. It's not really the best translation. It's been manipulated would probably be a better translation. It suffered from abuse. And that's exactly what was happening. And the violent have been seizing it by force. And they're trying to use it for their own purposes. You know, we got a lot of folks try to use God's work for their own purposes. I think one of the worst tragedies for me was one where you ended up with one of the TV evangelists and they found out what they were doing. This was back some years. That way I'm not touching on somebody's toes that uh, you may like today. He's not there anymore. But they found out he had a crew. And they would rip open the envelopes, take out the checks, and throw the prayer request away. Never even prayed over them. Maybe they prayed a global prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this envelopes. Amen. <laughs> I don't know what they did. But it was basically using religion for his own goals. And if God is just going to be my servant, then he's not my God. Because God doesn't need people to treat him like a servant. We need God to be our God. And we so often turn it around. They are trying to actually use the kingdom of God that way, promote their own revolutions, everything else. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you're willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Let anyone who has ears listen. That phrase keeps coming up multiple times. Then we're going to get an Old Testament parable. I told you we'd cover one. To what should I compare this generation? It's like children sitting in the marketplace who call out to other children. We played the flute for you, but you didn't dance. We sang a lament, but you didn't mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors. must not have been Baptist. They're saying he's a drunkard. Not certain types of Baptists. <laughs> Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. See where the outcome is, and you'll know whether this was a godly way or not. And the people are being helped by Jesus, and they're being swindled by the leaders in Jerusalem. And something's very much gone wrong in Jerusalem at the temple. We see this Mashal. The children actually did not get to do that much in social settings. But they did get to go to weddings, and they did get to go to funerals. And so that's really the background here. And so they'd play games. Let's play wedding. Let's play funeral. And they'd sing a dirge, and everybody would pretend, yeah, oh. They had professional lamenters. They'd seen all these. They knew how it worked. And so they would sing a, a sad song. Let's play a sad game. Let's play a happy game, wedding game. And this mashal you could use in any given setting. Because the whole point is, God has come to us in John the Baptist with one approach. He's come to us in Jesus with another approach. And pretty soon, if you don't like any of the games, it's pretty obvious. It's not the game that you're rejecting. You're rejecting who you're playing with. And God approaches us however we need to be approached. And if you reject God's approach this way, he comes this way. If you reject it that way, well, pretty soon, if you keep rejecting, it's pretty obvious. It's not the approach. You just don't want God involved in what you're doing and who you are. I had a good friend, former student of mine, and he actually, I make students do rewrites on the parables to where they try to tell it in modern terms. They capture the point of the parable. And I thought he did a great job on this one. I've adapted it some, so the bad parts are mine, the good parts are his. But at any rate, and so the dad was listening to the game. It was really an amazing game. It was the state high school championship game. And his son was playing. And as he sat there listening to the radio, to the game going on, he was just amazed because his son was performing like never before, and his team won the game. And at the end of the game, they had the interviews, and on the radio they were interviewing finally his son. And he said, this is my moment. Because they asked the question, who had the greatest impact on you to where you became a quarterback who could play like this? He said, I know he's going to name me. Everybody's going to know about me. 
And his son said, well, the one who had the biggest impact on me, he said, here it comes, was my uncle. And the dad just fell flat. And he said, what in the world is going on? And I just knocked those projectors out. Wow. <laughs> there we go. We'll get them back on. What's going on? What's going on? And the son shows up late, late in the evening, approaching midnight or later. And the dad's still waiting for him and said, son, I don't understand. Why'd you say your uncle? Why didn't you mention me in the interview? He said, well, dad, don't you remember? I wanted to play ball with you more than anything else in my life. And it came around to where it was basketball season. And I got the ball out. And I was trying to dribble it outside. And I came in. I said, dad, dad, teach me how to play basketball. And you said, son, I've worked hard all day. And I don't have time for kids' games like this. Go find somebody else to play with. And my uncle across the street saw me playing, and he came over and said, Would you like to learn how to play basketball? And he taught me how to shoot, and he taught me how to dribble. Dad, don't you remember? I came. You were in your easy chair, and I came up to you, and I had your glove as well as my glove, and I had the ball here, and I had the bat. I said, Dad, Dad, teach me how to play baseball. And you said, Son, my arm's sore, and I'm... I don't really want to bother with this. I got important stuff to deal with. And he kept watching TV. He said, Dad, what I wanted most was to play ball with you. And then football season came around. My uncle taught me how to play basketball. He came over, taught me how to play baseball. And on the football, well, I knew you weren't going to play. And he came over and he taught me how to throw a football. And he's had the biggest impact on me. And the sad thing is, all I wanted, Dad, was to play ball with you. And I finally understood. It wasn't about the game. You didn't want to play ball with me. That was really what the story was. When God approaches us, the implication here is, are we going to be willing to play ball with God? Happy song, sad song. However God approaches us, it's not about the game. It's about who we're playing with. And God wants to be part of our lives. And he wants to be part of who we are, what we're doing, and us to be part of what he's doing and who he is. That's Hebrew Mashal. We've got one more item here, and I'm going to briefly touch on it because I really don't like getting into this one too much. And it's about... Jesus talking in Matthew 24, 25. We're not going to do Matthew 24, all of it. But I do want you to understand something. First, he says, nobody knows when the second coming is going to happen. And he says, in a generation, all this is going to come about. But he's talked about the fall of the temple, folks. And so he dies in AD 30. What's a generation in the Old Testament? How many years? 40 years, right? And the temple is destroyed in AD 70. It's one of the most specific prophecies in all of history. And exactly 40 years later, that temple is destroyed. And that's what he talked about in part. He talked about more. But in part, he talked about the fact, these buildings, see all these buildings? There's not going to be left one stone on another. And that's exactly what happened to where even today, there's fussing about exactly where the temple was on the Temple Mount. Now, it's not big fussing. It was on the Temple Mount. And it was in this general area. But there's one group. Jewish group trying to say, we think we can build one right over here and it'd still be close. It might even cover some of where the temple was. Well, you're going to have a much bigger war than we got going on now if they try to build a temple on that temple mount. I went to a group there. It was one of the scariest things I ever saw in Israel. Now, I'm very pro-Israel. Don't hear me wrong. But there's actually a group, the third temple group, and they have all the high priestly garments ready. I was able to see all this. I, I was shocked. They spent literally millions of dollars being ready. They said, if at any given moment we're able, we have it all ready to put another temple in. That's scary talk to me because that's a major war. <laughs> that's not going to happen without a major war. Regardless, the setting was there. And they wondered about that temple. And they would love to see it built again in that group. That's an ultra-Orthodox group. 
It's not the biggest group of Judaism at all, thankfully. They're not the dominant power, thankfully. But that was their thinking about it. When you get to this, now Jesus says, but about when the end's going to come, nobody knows. Nobody knows when the second coming's coming. Everybody so far is batting zero, zero, zero. And if you've ever played baseball, that's not even bad. Uh, that, that's below pitiful. Everybody can get lucky enough to get one hit every now and then. <laughs> so what he says is, but your job never changes. You're supposed to be ready. We get the parable of the ten virgins. He's just told them, he may come back sooner than you think. You better be ready. Don't be living your life thinking, well, you know, I got a lot of time. I don't have to worry about it. We don't know when our time's coming up. We don't know when our time is coming up. But we do know what we're supposed to do in the meantime. We're supposed to be ready. It may be longer than you think, the parable of the ten virgins. And you better be ready for the long haul. Some of y'all have already been living in the long haul. Because I remember being told by a well-known Jesus movement figure, in 1972, he said, Jesus will come back within two years. I've had a vision. I know it's going to happen. You don't have more than two years. And I told my parents, I'm not going to college. I'm going to get on my motorcycle. I'm going to ride around the country. I'll tell people about Jesus maybe, but I'll enjoy riding around the country anyway. And I don't want to spend the last two years on planet Earth going to college. And they said, you're not going to do that. We're simply not going to allow it. And I had enough respect for my parents to understand I wasn't going to go riding around the country. And I was in college. <laughs> then they started saying, when are you ever going to get out? But anyway, that's another issue. <laughs> so it may be longer than we think. We better be ready. Be faithful, no matter whether it's sooner or later. Be faithful and be ready. Well, how do you get ready? Parable of the talents. How, what does it mean to get ready? What does it mean to be prepared? Take what God has given you and use it in the right way. And don't just go bury it in a hole and waste it. God has blessed every one of us with the ability to have an impact. And we're supposed to have whatever impact we can in the best way possible. Well, what do you mean have an impact? And then we get to the last part of chapter 25. And what he says, I'll tell you what it means to have an impact. It's not going out there and trying to say, I'm going to do this, do that necessarily. It's simply being who God's called you to be. To where when Jesus comes, well, I was naked and you clothed me. Well, wait a minute. When did we do that? I was hungry. You gave me food. I was in prison. You visited me. So, well, when did we do that? They didn't do it because... It was Jesus. They did it because that's who they were. And that's who God's forming us to be. And it ties right in with the message earlier this morning. Because we simply are friends to those who need friends. And we minister to those who need us to minister to them. And we help those who need our help. And we do what we can because this world will never be the tight place it ought to be if we don't make the effort to be godly people and show the love of God to those around us. And that's basically what the message is. And if you want to be ready for God's judgment, he's not talking to Christians on these parables. Remember, it's still pre-cross resurrection. If you want to be who God wants you to be, do what God's told you to do. It's not about works. He's not talking about you're going to earn favor with God. You can't earn favor in relationships and have a good relationship. If you've got to manipulate somebody to have a relationship, that's not a healthy relationship. It's never been a healthy relationship. It's always been by a pledge of faith slash faithfulness. When you talk about what you believe, it's faith. When you talk about people, it's faithfulness. So if you talk about Jesus, we're talking about a pledge of faithfulness. We believe God sent him. He's God's incarnate son. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. But our pledge is, and I will follow Jesus faithfully. And that's what faith is about. That's where the parables come in, and they're powerful, and they tell us. What did Jesus think about the end? He wasn't as worried about when. He was more concerned about 
will we be the people God's called us to be until he comes? Because that's what we got to answer for. I'm not going to be held up to say, you got your calendar wrong. I'm sorry, you thought it was the wrong year. God could care less about that. I'm going to be judged by how did I show God's love to the people around me? How did I listen to God when he tried to speak to me and transform my life? That's what I'm going to be accountable for. Did I follow Jesus faithfully? We need some time for questions. And so let's just open it up at this point. We've got a whole other set about prayer. We've got another set about some of the other issues for tomorrow night. Uh, it's amazing. Jesus' primary teaching on prayer actually comes in parables. They come by way of parables. So we'll be looking at that in part. Questions you might have. Everybody here is free to ask a question except one person. <laughs> I wish I had those hearing aids to where she didn't hear me. But... <laughs> You know, Paul says a lot of times, pray for me. <laughs> I don't think he meant pray for my survival, but anyway. <laughs> Any questions you might have? Questions about the parables, the larger context, whatever it might be. I teach primarily, I teach the Gospels a lot. That's not the only part I teach. I teach Pauline theology some overseas, actually, more than in New Orleans. I'm not Calvinistic, and so I don't know, that's sort of going a different direction sometimes. Uh, but anyway, uh, that's, um, uh, but I also teach about the background. Social science is what we call it, it's the social settings of the Gospels. And uh, then I have textual criticism as actually my number one field. So, yeah. One here and one here. For the parables, yeah, there actually are some really good ones that have come out. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll actually put them on a slide to be able to put you those to where you don't have to real quickly try to write them out. Because we have had some really good books come out, putting in the context a lot more into the study of the parables. Yeah, And there's a lot of good ones that, that are not brand new. So don't think that I mean the others are not. They're, they're very good. But the explosion of archaeological work, the explosion of the findings of information from manuscripts, not biblical manuscripts, has really caused our knowledge of the setting to explode. There's a whole commentary series coming out, and it's based on the documentary papyri, which are marriage contracts, legal items, sales receipts, everything else, letters, personal letters. But they give us knowledge that goes way past some of the formal writing, which is what we've tended to use. The formal writing comes from the upper class. Our New Testament, they actually used to call it Holy Ghost Greek because it didn't match the formal writing. But all it is is you're going to a lower level of, of society. And our writings are not, by and large, from the upper levels of society. They're from more of the common folks. These are not the movers and shakers politically who are doing these writings. Well, we had a lot of words we thought were unique words because we'd only find them once in the New Testament. We had a fancy word for it, hapax legomena. And all, all it says is, say it only once. <laughs> and so uh, uh, most of those are no longer single occurrence words because in this common lower level literature, we're finding these words. And they were actually simply from a lower literary level, the common folks. They weren't from the high literary levels. And so, yeah, so it's exploded our knowledge of the context. So I'll give you some info on some of those on parables. Yeah, definitely they fit the narrative that Luke has. And that's what we need to understand. I'm actually, I've taken a time out to finish something that we're started on now on the, the Textual Studies Center. Uh, but I've got a book that I started, and it's a literary approach, gospel by gospel about the parables. Because we have them, and we can study them separately. But actually, in their literary context, they mean even more. That was why on the Good Samaritan we started back with the question, because that's the context. And Luke is not really just giving us a parable, he's answering questions that had come up. 
uh, we'll see the same thing on the prodigal son. There's a context. And if you don't get the context, you'll really miss what the parable is about. Even the one, the parable about the soil and the sower, the four types of soil, that's coming right after conflict with Jewish leaders where they're openly rejecting Jesus. So, yeah. And family who's having some issues about it. My favorite still is the prodigal son. Uh, I just can't get away how powerful it is. It's not what we always make it to be. Uh, what people miss, and we'll go into this more tomorrow night, is when he squanders his inheritance, this is not a spiritualized parable. He's squandering his Judaism. He's been raised as a good Jewish boy. Sinners and tax collectors. That's the group he represents. The older son represents Pharisees and scribes. And what's happened is they reject all these sinners and tax collectors. Jesus is eating with them because they're not good Jews according to their rules. And this boy squandered all of his inheritance, all of his Jewishness. And uh, when you get that picture, you understand the parable a lot better. It just opens it up before you. Because yeah. we've done that a lot of times. I squandered a lot of my inheritance. I was raised going to the Episcopal Church. I was there every Sunday serving as an altar boy, an acolyte. And, uh, and I knew those creeds. And, and I had high spiritual moments, but I squandered it all. And praise God, I went to this old lady's Bible study. <laughs> my gosh, did God use her. The rest of that story is, remarkably, I've got a lady from Holland in my church, older than I am. That means she's older, old, but no, that doesn't mean that. But anyway, her mom was personal friends. Her mom's dad, her um, father, they had actually been in the Tin Boom home, and they knew them there. And then she came to Christ because at the end of World War II, a massive revival broke out, mostly across the border in Germany. And they went to a lot of those meetings, and they came to Christ in their family due to that. So, so the connection sort of kept going. Jesus, if Jesus came today to Israel, what's going on? Would he teach this parable? How would he be, how, what would be his approach, and what would, what would you think would happen? How would Jesus teach today? Yeah. He would still confront abuses of power. He would still confront open immorality. Uh, because he does tell people that you've got to live a holy life. Uh, that is built into what he's saying. Uh, he would confront the fact that too often we think we're more right with God than what our lifestyle shows. Uh, because we're not showing God's love to those around us. And so I think he would confront a lot of our living and say, there's a shallowness here. And we've got to get past that shallowness to where we're actually living to make a difference. If there's any hope in this world, part of our Christian focus is we need to be ones helping to make that difference. Uh, it's not going to happen by people that are sold more towards violence, manipulation, domineering over others. It's not going to happen by way of those folks. They're going to pull us down the rabbit hole. We're going to literally just go down with the ship with that. It's going to happen by people saying, even if it's of no good to me, my integrity won't let me do this. Even if my integrity means I have to give up too much, I'm going to give it up because I will be a person of integrity. And I'm just not going to compromise on my character and on certain issues about how I'm going to treat the people around me. Um, my mom was a great example of that once to me. Uh, I told her, good thing you were in the setting and not me. She worked teaching English as a second language with internationals. Then she helped counsel them to help see them through many times difficult marriages with servicemen and such. And one of them 
wanted to sell her a property she had in Destin, Florida, right across from the beach. And she was going to sell it to her for $40,000 back in the mid-80s. And my mom thought about it. They knew it was worth a lot more than that. And she finally said, I cannot do this with you. You are somebody I'm ministering to, and I will not make money like this off of my ministry to you. And she refused it. I said, boy, you better be glad you didn't let me know about it. <laughs> I said, I wasn't ministering to her. <laughs> no. <laughs> that place has a huge condo on it today, and it would be worth literally probably millions of dollars on that property. That was integrity. And I thank my parents for teaching me integrity on that. You know, even before they came to Christ, they were people of integrity. Uh, the Christian influence they had in their background had caused them to be people of integrity. That's how we're going to make a difference, to where we actually help people. And we don't do it for what we're going to get out of it. We do it because God has called us to minister to the people around us. He's called us to be certain types of people, making a certain type of example available to this world. And it's not going to be that we change it necessarily. Some will from the top down, but we will change it from the bottom up. And it's happened all around this world. And that's how God has changed settings. And so well, you've got somebody who knows more about it than me, but in Colombia, the changes were happening in the churches from the bottom up. The poor people were responding. And now they actually have a middle class. And they got more integrity a lot of times in that emerging poor and middle class group than they ever will have in the top group. So. Text criticism is far removed from most of us in this room. Are you yeah. free to share um, some of the stories of what's happening like in the Middle East and how the work of textual criticism is going to impact what God is doing there? Yeah, it's um, part of the project we're working on is to provide a Greek text for use by Bible translators. Uh, Greek text had to be totally free and open to anyone to use however they need to use it. But we want this text to be as academically responsible as possible because what they need is good quality. They don't need a text that then somebody's going to come back and say, you know, you used the wrong foundation on this. we got to redo all of it. And so that's part of the, what we're doing at the research center I'm at. Uh, we got quite a few of us involved on that project right now. And so uh, it's people that are waiting for this, for their translations to move forward. And so one picture I think really told a lot. I don't have the picture here, and I couldn't show it unless we covered up the faces anyway. Uh, but it was from a Middle Eastern country. Uh, uh, we no longer have our military there, but I won't tell you the name of the country. Uh, but... Um, they actually have a group sitting around doing Bible translation into some languages that don't yet have the Bible in their language. And these are former Taliban and Al-Qaeda members who have come to Christ. And their desire to follow Christ has led them to get involved in Bible translation for their people because in the languages their people speak, they don't have a Bible in that language yet. There are people around this world who are paying high prices. These people meet in a closed setting because they're always going to be faced with threats because they have now become followers of Christ. And uh, that's who we're helping when we send people in all these settings. You do it. We do it. Christians around. When we pray for them, don't ever forget prayer is a fabulous ministry in and of itself. Let's get God involved on what's happening. But God is moving around this world and uh, there are more Christians gathering on any given Sunday in sub-Saharan Africa than in any continent in the world. Think about that. Do you recommend, so. uh, you know, I get lots of nonprofit translation yeah. charity things. Yeah. You know, is there any you really have to be careful to check them out. Some of the big, well-known names, you're going to be solid on giving to them. 
uh, you know, Wycliffe Summer Institute of Linguistics, some of the ones off of that. Uh, they're very solid. The Bible Societies, American uh, United Bible Societies, they're very solid on it. You always have to be careful because nowadays people know you can make money off religion. And they will have groups that they start. And when you find these groups are keeping 75% of the money for themselves, you need to X them off your list. Uh, that type of overhead is unreasonable and irresponsible and full of greed. And there's no way you ought to have that much overhead. And so that's um, where you just really have to be careful about the groups. Huh? I don't have a list per se. I know who we give to, but that's not the list I wanted to share. So, <laughs> so yeah. I was just going to ask, on the text, the sources themselves, I mean, clearly you all have some, but then with new things that are continuing to be it's amazing. We're in a time period of finding more and more manuscripts. So do you go to them? No, we've created an international project. This one is headquartered in, well, it was in both Birmingham, England, and Munster, and now it's in Munster, Germany. And it's an online database with images to access almost all existing New Testament manuscripts, Greek manuscripts. We have other databases for the Latin and for other languages that come into play. But now online, you can actually, we'll see the image, we'll make the transcription right there online, and it's available to everybody. And so that's revolutionized the field. Uh, one of the really big projects we're doing is to work through as many as we can on those. Sometimes you don't have to work through every manuscript because you'll have a group and you know these were all copied from this one up here. Well, don't worry about those. Just get the one that they copied from you know, because you're just imitating the same work. And so we will see those things. So we don't have to do every manuscript, but we have to know when they're linked or not. And so you still got to do enough study to know that. And so um, we're at about 5,700 actual manuscripts of the Greek New Testament. The numbers are bigger. The number will be almost 6,000. 6, some of those are duplicates of the same manuscript. A few of them we've had to kick out because they're forgeries. And uh, not that many, but there are some. And so that's where uh, we're at about 5,700, and we try to work through those and make sure we have a good foundation that is representative of all the different readings on those. So it takes a lot of work to go through the Gospel of John once and a Greek manuscript for somebody that is medium proficient at doing it. Maybe they, they're a doctoral student. They've done it for a few years. It'll probably take them nearly 40 hours for one pass through. And uh, that's just one pass through the gospel. You have to go through it at least twice, then have somebody reconcile the two, two different people, before we would say this is the right readings from this manuscript. So we have to have checks and balances to ensure the accuracy. And you have to note everything today. It used to be you only noted the readings you thought would be most important. You don't notice, uh, note some of the minor stuff. We're noting line breaks. We're noting marginal items. We're noting everything so that in the future we don't have to go back through them in order to pick up all that stuff. Now we're even starting to note punctuation. A lot of people don't realize even our oldest manuscripts have some segmentation punctuation. You know, a lot of people hear, well, the old ones don't have punctuation. Well, that's really not true. They don't have as much as the more recent ones. That's definitely true. But they still have segmentation and everything else. And so we're in another time of trying to reevaluate, do we have some of the punctuation right? A classic example would be in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, passage probably y'all have never heard of, but verses 34, 33, 34, 35. And it's a passage about women being silent in the churches. And... Uh, <laughs> Exactly on that passage, the punctuation is finally being straightened out. Now, this is one where it used to be right, and then with several issues coming into play, everybody changed it, except just a very few. And the translations changed it. Now we're going back to where the manuscripts actually had it. And what the manuscripts have is, verse 33 is a verse by itself. Uh, for God is not one of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. And it all stays together. 
as in all the churches of the saints, does not go with verse 34. It's very much with verse 33. And the principle is, God's always a God of peace, not confusion. Then you have the issue of ones attending the worship service in 34, 35. Now we have also verified that that is not missing in any manuscripts now. We just had meetings this past week and Tuesday of last week, a great chemical analysis of ink and some of the older manuscripts showed uh, it is original to these manuscripts. It's not a later item or anything. Uh, Codex Vaticanus was a big one there. Uh, but at any rate, and so then you get a two-verse part, and originally it does seem to come after verse 33. Now then all we have to do is interpret 34, 35. But it's not about people speaking in worship. That's already been covered. Now it's about people attending worship. Ah. Well, most people want to make that be about people leading worship. It's not even about people leading worship. That's already been covered up above. When you attend worship, guess where the noise is going to come from? Guess where the kids are? Who are they with? Y'all know how this works. The kids are with the women. And so guess who's not going to be able to hear so well? The ones with the kids all around them. And it is about causing a problem in the worship service with the noise. Sometimes I think it's deacons at the back of the church. I've heard them making a lot of noise. People can't hear. Well, let the deacons be quiet during church. If they want to know what went on, let them go ask. Well, actually, they're probably not talking about church anyway, but anyway, that, that's another issue. But it actually has nothing to do with women leading in the worship service. It's about people attending the worship service. And so we've had a lot of misuse. And if you move verse 33 on the punctuation, then you've got it as in all the churches of the saints, let the woman be silent. Boy, that's a whole different thing. That's a universal item then. That's not a particular case in Corinth. But that's the wrong punctuation according to almost every Greek manuscript up to the year 1000. They all have it punctuated at the end of verse 33. That's where even punctuation makes a big difference because God's a God of peace, not of confusion, as in all the churches of the saints. End of the section about public worship. Now about those in the worship service. Don't be making a lot of noise there. Don't be speaking out causing problems there. That's 34, 35. That's free. That has nothing to do with parables. <laughs> and we're not going down that, that trail because that's a rabbit that runs and runs and runs. <laughs> and so we're just going to leave that one right there. It's sure been good to be with you. We're going to look at more tomorrow night, and I hope you'll be able to come back. Pastor? Oh, I'm sorry. We've got an important person going to speak here. So. Where the gospel is spreading in the Middle East, women are at the forefront. If you hear the stories out of Iran, Iran has, in the past few years, been the fastest growing Christian setting in the world. Think about that. You don't get that in our news. It's been the fastest growing Christian setting in the world. Not the biggest numbers. We're talking about how fast the church is growing, the racial and the people leading it are women. And they've got testimony from these women, and they say, this has changed our life coming to Christ. And we will tell the story even when they tell us not to. We know they're going to rape us. We know they're going to put us in prison. We have decided we will pay the price to make sure people hear the story about Jesus. Isn't that phenomenal? It's not saying no men are there, but the women are leading the charge on this. So, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm only going to recognize one other person because the last time we were together, I overlooked him. Ray, I saw your hand up. Did you have a question? And, and I overlooked you last time. I'm not going to overlook you this time. The disciples seem to want Jesus to tell them when he's coming back. Yep. What do you think his philosophy was on the rapture? 
first. I apologize for pointing Ray. <laughs> first, I think we have to realize how radical it is for them to even think about a second coming. In the Old Testament, they don't think about two comings of the Messiah. Their hope in the first century is for a coming of the Messiah, one coming. That's why they so get bothered by how the ministry of Jesus is developing, because it is supposed to bring the fullness of the kingdom. Notice what they say in Acts chapter 1. Is it at this time that you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They think it's going to be now. The whole second coming hope grows in the church. It's there in the ministry of Jesus exactly because the kingdom is already but not yet. Because he's bringing the kingdom and it's growing and it's exploding in many ways around the globe, but the fullness is not yet here. And the second coming says, but one day God will fulfill His promises and we will see the fullness of the kingdom here. Amen. Notice there's a new heaven and a new earth. And we actually end up with God having the setting like He intended it to be. Let's go back to the garden pre-sin Let's have personal fellowship with God as a normal pattern of life. And I don't think the New Testament teaches a rapture. I don't think it's there. I think we have created that. Remember, it arises in the early 1800s as a belief in Christianity. It's not there before that. And it arises exactly as a goal to where we escape whatever tribulation there's going to be. I don't think textually Paul's thinking that. In the book of Revelation, you have to work to fit it in. It really doesn't fit. So you've got to create a whole new Jewish turning back towards Judaism, focus, everything else. You've got to do hermeneutical gymnastics to get it to fit. Whenever we have to do that, we need to go back to square one and ask, is the concept even correct or are we imposing it on the text? Now, do they believe in a second coming? I don't think there's any question about it. One day, God's going to bring His promises to full fruition, and this world's going to be the place God intended it to be. And we are going to rejoice and celebrate with our Lord Jesus when that happens. All the details about it, it's going to be wonderful when we see those fall out. We got glimpses of it, but I don't think we have a lot more. Because our role is, be ready. Thank you, Dr. Warren. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Yeah. May not be the answer you tomorrow wanted. Evening. That's where I'm at. Please so. join us tomorrow evening, uh, 6 o'clock. We will try to saddle a few more of these. Uh, 5.30, we will eat together. Please come and join us. Let's pray. So, Lord, you've given us ears.